guys. Welcome to the Tech Point Africa podcast. My name is Tim Gosvin. So I'm um, just going straight to the point today. There's no no beating around the bush <laughs> because you have a very very important topic. And if you've been on Twitter or if you're on Twitter and you've been um, hearing some or seeing some of the conversations in the last, I think, one week, um, we've we've seen a lot of people ask what exactly is a digital nation? How can that be achieved? Um, after someone made it, I think someone made a post and was wondering what Afropolitan does. So today we have Eche Emole, he's the CEO and the co-founder of um, Afropolitan. And today we are going to be discussing what Afropolitan is, um, why do we need a digital nation and any other thing. So drop your questions in the comment as you go through and um, we will probably address all of your questions. So hi Eche, welcome to Thank the you for having me. Podcast. All right, so let's just get mm-hmm. into it. Let's start with a brief background of yourself. Um, mm-hmm. What were you doing before now, and what led to Afropolita? Yeah, so my name is Eche. I'm one of the co-founders of Afropolitan. My background, educational background, I studied politics, did my master's in political science, also did law school, um, by transition into fintech. So I used to be an executive at Flutterwave, right? And then from Flutterwave, I transitioned into Afropolitan full-time. So that's my background. All right. Very yeah. brief and <laughs> straight to the point. So what is Afropolitan and what is a digital nation? Yeah, so what Afropolitan is today, right, is a network comprising the best that Africa has to offer across multiple sectors, right? So think art, finance, tech, energy, sports, media, right? Um, but what Afropolitan wants to be in the future is the first ever internet country, right? And the idea for that is this idea of a network state, right? And a network state is basically a highly aligned online community with a capacity for collective action and and, and an ability to crowdfund territory and eventually gain diplomatic recognition from pre-existing states. And that's the idea of the digital nation. Okay, so that's a very grand Mm -hmm. idea. Mm -hmm. And someone someone could ask first, why do we need Mm -hmm. a digital nation? Yeah. And what are the benefits for anyone who decides yeah. to be a part of this? Yeah. What are the benefits? Yeah, so I think the the reason why we believe the digital nation or the network states is a better alternative than what we now have is we're leveraging the internet to achieve it, right? So if you consider the benefits that we've, ach- we've achieved through the internet in the last couple of years, it's been the best equalizer for black people, Africans globally, right? And I'll explain Prior to the internet, let's take music, for example. Maybe a burner boy would wants to get his music played. He has to go to one radio station. Maybe the person likes him, maybe doesn't. They're going to play They won't play him, right? But now with, with the internet, he streams his music, and somebody in Finland can hear him. Immediately he drops his music. And then because of that, he's now getting booked for shows in faraway places. That's just music, right? Let's now bring it to founders and capital, right? Prior to the internet... Maybe you want investments in your startup. You go and meet one bigger guy. Bigger guy will say, I'll give you 10K for 50% equity in your company. You're like, you don't know better. There's not enough information, so you take those deals. Now you know you can actually get capital from investors across the world, right? It's a Zoom call. It's Google. You can talk to any investors. Even for us, we, we got investors from as far as India, from as far as South Korea. But now it was because of the internet, right? So you, the, the capital can now flow at scale, right? That's an, another example. Let's talk about even just information, right? Prior to internet, maybe you go to school, it's a library, you, you read all the things in that library. If, there's, if Whatever you're looking for, if it's not in that library, nothing for you, right? But now with the internet, you can go on Google. At least there's way more information out there now that we can leverage compared to back in the day. So I've just given some examples of the benefits that we're going from the internet. The next level, though, is the social networks, right? These days, you could be friends with somebody who's 3,000 miles away. You have more of a connection and shared purpose with them than your neighbor next door. Most people around the world might not even know who their neighbor is or who their people in their neighborhood are, but they have a connection with, let's say you're in a clubhouse community or you're in a Discord community or a Telegram community. Those people in your group chats, even though they're far away, are people you might have shared purpose and values with, right? So what we're now saying is, is it possible then at scale, if you have a highly aligned online community, to now build the first ever internet country with these people who are able to do things like have a capacity for collective action? I'll give you an example. During NSAS, right, Afropolitan's community was able to raise money for the protest from people who did not live side by side. 
all we had to do was everybody was aligned on our clubhouse. We were raising to fund um, the feminist coalition or fund fund the protesters. Here's where you um, send the money to. We collected the money and we sent it to the um, f- um, protesters. Right? Okay. Ethiopian crisis starts. Okay. There's a refugee situation going on. We're raising money. Okay. We crowdfund the money and we send it to them. These are now things that. Possible through the internet that were not possible maybe 20, 30 years ago. And what we're, our argument is we've been able to start new companies on the internet. For example, think Paystacks, what's already in the last six years, right? We've been able to start new currencies on the internet, Bitcoin, cryptocurrencies. Can we start new countries on the internet? And that's the proposal. Interesting. So, can we start new countries on the internet? Um, I'll wager that starting a new company is, is pretty. Mm-hmm. Easy. First, you don't have to deal with the issue of sovereignty. Mm-hmm. You don't have to deal with the issue of enforcing law and all that. You mm-hmm. just submit to mm-hmm. um, the lo- laws in a specific mm-hmm. place. But if you're going to do that for a country, there are a lot of things you need to consider. Mm-hmm. You need to talk about um, law and order. Mm-hmm. You need to talk about the currency. Mm-hmm. Um, you need to talk about uh, your passport mm-hmm. or something that identifies the members of that yeah. country outside. Mm-hmm. So, And I know that um, Afropolitan has a plan at least around the um, the identity part mm-hmm. is you, you, I read the manifesto and you mentioned something about seeding it mm-hmm. with NFT so can we start with that the, mm-hmm. there are four phases mm-hmm. on your plan mm-hmm. or of your plan to get to mm-hmm. the digital nation so can we go through just take mm-hmm. through the phases and what yeah. the timeline would look like okay so I think before we start the phases because you said it's definitely easier to start a company now yeah. than to definitely start, start a country right but let's actually also focus on why are we even to the point why we feel like we have to start a new country, right? Mm-hmm. Let's let's take the example of the companies that you gave, right? In Africa today, your startup, you raised money, maybe $5 billion in funding went to startups last year, right? Mm-hmm. Most of those startups, you know, what is their biggest competition for most of those startups? It's not other companies. It's poor government regulation or just bad governance in general, right? So you have a situation where an entire sector can be affected, like the right mobility startups, right? just wiped out in value, or any other sectors that have suffered because of bad governance and bad governance policies, right? So our approach was basically saying, picture a house that has a weak foundation, right? The owners of that house say, we want to fix this foundation. But instead of fixing the foundation, they say, okay, you know what, let's paint the walls. After painting the walls, let's fix the lights. After fixing the lights, let's, you know, fix the AC. They do all those things, but the house ends up collapsing, right? The analogy here is, those lights are like our fintech sectors. The AC is like maybe healthcare sector. The the walls are maybe your agri-tech sector. Until you fix the foundation, which is the governance layer, right? All of that crumbles regardless. And we've seen that happen across Africa, right? So we now laid out a four-phase plan to get to, you know, this final manifestation of the network state. Phase one is, first of all, growing the community. Because remember, the definition of a network state is a highly aligned online community, not highly online, right? Because there's a difference now, because in the 2000s, maybe you'd say, okay, how many followers do you have, right? Now you're filtering for alignments, and alignment is a different layer. layer. So we're looking to recruit the first 1,000 citizens in this phase one, right? This is a highly aligned online community, people who help us set the um, um, code of conduct, the values, ratify the constitution, so that as you're onboarding more people, people know this is the foundational layer that has been set. That's phase one. And to identify these initial members, right, you're going to give them NFTs that serve as the identification. Those NFTs today will be considered digital passports, but in the future, it will be physical passports that they can use to get access into not just Afropolitan um, physical land, but also around the world, right? So that's phase one. Phase two is something we're calling government as a service, right? What does that look like? We want to unbundle some government services and we bundle them within an Afropolitan super app, right? I'll give you an example. Afropolitan started off with, you know, during this whole year of return in Ghana, there's a whole context and history that we have to actually go into. When people were coming for the first time, you can imagine million plus people from the diaspora coming to Ghana for the first time. They, they don't have things like know how to get SIM card, know how to change local currency. They don't know what to start. What we did was we provided a base layer for them where they tapped into, and they were able to, once you landed in Ghana, we provided a new visa on arrival. From there at the airport, we had transportation from the airport to the hotel, from the hotel to all the events that were happening during that period, right? We had one ticket for you to access all the events, right? 
We also had local SIM card ready for you and local currency exchange that you had requested ready for you. So a full service suite, right? What we're now saying is, what does that look like in a government type setting? We want the Afropolitan Super App to be able to do things like remittances powered by crypto, right? The African diaspora sends home $70 billion worth of funding every year, right? We want that to happen. We also want things like self-serving ID, similar to like your local KYC, right? You have your ID on your phone, you flip, you're verified, you're not able to do transactions and make payments as you go. We want to do things like risk capital. You know, if you want to invest in stocks and crypto, you should be able to do that within the super app. We also want to do things like maybe just other value-added services similar to WeChat out of China, right? Where you stack up value-added services on there and the way you generate revenues as your citizens use these services, you, tra- you charge a transaction fee on each of those services. That's phase two. Phase three is what we're calling the minimum viable state, which is we want to ladder up the credibility needed to to be viewed as a country in the future. Basically, is the show walking. Nigerians will say show walkings, right? So, on one hand, it's there's intangible and tangible value, right? Intangible value could be things like we got recognized by the New York Stock Exchange on September 13th as the first ever internet country. Okay, that's a 200-year-old institution that's very revered, saying, hey, we recognize you and we're in support of your vision. Cool, that's an intangible maybe. Tangible value could be, hey, you're an Afropolitan member today. Because of our network, uh, right, and the type of people we have within our network and the resources that we have, if you're a founder and you're looking for funding, Afropolitan can get you funded. If you're a creative and you want to get your art and your music or anything out there, you want to play in certain rooms in certain areas, Afropolitan can connect you with the best people who are looking f- for your art. If you're a writer, if you're a journalist, you want to get the best jobs to do content writing, shooting videos, doing podcasts, Afropolitan can connect you to the resources necessary for that. So it's showcasing that value where if you're providing people enough value over time, they then trust you with more when you then say, hey, we want to then be a country, you're ladding up to that level. So that's phase four. I'm going to phase four now. Phase four is where the physical land piece comes in, right? But this time we want to innovate on what the land piece would look like. What does that look like? We want to combine two concepts together. One is an embassy, and the other one is a Chinatown. So take, for example, the Nigerian embassy maybe in the U.S. is a sovereign territory in a host government. In Chinatowns, they have their own post office, their own mall, their own little commerce within there. Combine those two ideas together, what we want to have in the future is a sovereign Afro town. So then let's zoom out to to bring this together. You're an Afropolitan citizen. You navigate the world with your Afropolitan passport. You make payments for goods and services with your Afropolitan super app, and you're able to get physical entry into Afro towns located across the world, right? And that's the fullness of the vision. But as of today, what we're starting off with first is a highly aligned online community or network of people who comprise the best that Africa has to offer across the world. Okay. Yeah. So you currently have a few members, yeah. um, like your foundational members, mm-hmm. and this looks like a very interesting way of looking at citizenship. So mm-hmm. typically, you're a citizen of a place because you were born there. Yeah or you were born to parents who are from that area, mm-hmm. or everybody you, there's the same tribe. Yeah, mm-hmm. or you just opt in probably by staying for a specific number yep. of years. Now, what does that look like for Afropolitan? And hopefully, you can opt in and opt out. Yeah, of course. Meal. So you have to, how, yeah. how does that work? If I want to be yeah. a member of this um, nation, yeah. how do I opt in? Yeah, so right now, there's an application on the Afropolitan website, afropolitan.io. So if you want to be one of the foundational citizens, please apply. And the reason is that application is because you want to filter out for the right sort of founders and, and, and founding fathers or founding mothers that you want for this nation, right? To answer your question, it's an innovation on citizenship too. Maybe today you're a citizen or of a country or of a nation or state because we have shared DNA. Everybody here is evil. Everybody here is um, outside. Everybody here is... Um, Yoruba, right? What we're now saying is we want to flip that to say you're a citizen of this country because we have shared purpose and shared values, right? We believe in the same things. We see the world the same way. Because what we're saying is the shared DNA thing has run its course. And I'll explain. Right now in Nigeria, our election is coming up next year, right? And there's this Pital B forever that's happening and it's cutting across every religious line, every tribal line, every every sort of differences, right? And it's because we've now finally woken up to realize the Aosan man now knows his salvation cannot come from another Aosan man. The Yoruba man now knows his salvation cannot come from another Yoruba man in power. The Igbo man now knows his own salvation also cannot come from another Igbo man in power. 
what is the salvation now based on shared values, shared purpose? Because people now want, it's like same hopes, same fears, same dreams. But for so long, people have aspired to our votes by saying, local, you can't trust these people. Trust me, because me and you have the shared, same shared DNA, or sh- same, same shared um, blood. But that's not been working. And this, this same sentiment cuts across all of Africa, right? And so what we're now saying is, if we can gather together people who have shared values and purpose, but it cuts across not just tribe, religion, but cuts across borders, right? That's now another innovation of, of what a country can be, right? And that's, that's the way we look at it. Okay. So you mentioned the P2B favor. Mm-hmm. And um, so anyone could argue that at least in the last two to three years, mm-hmm. it, it seems Africans, possibly because we are having this population boom, especially for the young, mm-hmm. uh, younger population, mm-hmm. they're getting dissatisfied with mm-hmm. the status quo mm-hmm. and they are deciding to mm-hmm. get involved in political yes, yeah. um, affairs mm-hmm. themselves mm-hmm. as opposed to just staying mm-hmm. and hoping that something gets mm-hmm. right. Mm-hmm. Now, I could argue that that's probably a more mm-hmm. realistic way. Mm-hmm. So I think it's easier personally for me to go effect change at mm-hmm. the polls mm-hmm. as opposed to going mm-hmm. to start off um, yeah. a country yeah. Regardless of where it is, mm-hmm. even if I have shared um, mm-hmm. ideas, because mm-hmm. I could also argue that I could have shared um, shared ideals, shared ideologies with mm-hmm. people, mm-hmm. even though we mm-hmm. share the same DNA. So, mm-hmm. um, what true. would you say about that? So, I think the or why should we not yeah. why should we not go that route yeah. than the other? So, I think the best way to probably consider is is a hedge. So you get mm-hmm. so if this one don't work. Make sure they push this side, and this side don't work. Make sure they push this side. So it's not yeah. a, a this or, that. this or that, right? And the reason for that is you have to think about what would make somebody say to himself, instead of us maybe putting all our eggs in one basket with let's fix our nation do like a Labour Party versus let's start a new country. Tech people will say, is it a feature or is it a bug, right? You heard, have you heard that term before? Yeah. If it's a bug, it means, okay, this can be fixed. If it's fixed, everything, the car will see they move. If it's a feature, it means the car breaks down. Normally, it's always breaking down, right? And so for that, you look towards data, right? Nigeria is 60-something years old, right? Compare Nigeria to countries that started around the same time. And let's see which one is a feature and which one is a bug. Let's, let's look at it. Nigeria, 1960, independence, right? Countries, Singapore, we all started around the same time. Look at Singapore today, Nigeria today. Let's even say, forget the ones that we started with at the same time. Vietnam. The Vietnam War ended in 1975, 15 years after Nigeria's independence. Look at Vietnam today. Look at Nigeria today. That, was, that one's even maybe too far. Dubai, 1990, the year I was born, was a sand desert. I have a picture on my phone. Look at Dubai today. Look at Nigeria today. So what we now say is our grandparents or great-grandparents had a better Nigeria than me and you. So the country is going in reverse. Meanwhile, all these other countries that started off with Countries not being that well, their future generations are enjoying saying things. So you then say to yourself, what is the root cause? Let's do the analysis here, right? And when we were thinking about this important thing, we said, we, we drew inspiration from the American founding fathers, right? When they were starting out, they used to write this thing called the Federalist Papers, right? And then Alexander Hamilton, who was one of their own founding fathers, said, in quotes, is it possible for societies of men to choose the political constitution or governance through reflection and choice, or are we forever destined to depend on it through accident and force? So then I asked myself, and we asked ourselves, what modern day nation states in Africa was chosen by reflection and choice? Or has it always been through accident and force? So you see, what we're really attacking is the foundation itself, going back to that analogy, right? What we're arguing is the foundation it was never strong. It was weak from the get-go. So what we've kept on doing in Africa is trying to fix the foundation by fixing the lights and everything. It's not working. Because until you go and fix the actual foundation, we keep running into the same mistakes. So then, what we now say is, instead of us putting all our eggs in one basket, seen as... Because this Peter Obi thing is not the first time it's happened in Nigeria. Our parents had their own. Our grandparents had their own. The same thing with the NSAS protest. It wasn't the first protest that has happened in Nigeria. Multiple generations have had protests against Nigerian governments, right? But there seems to be a feature that keeps replaying over and over. So then you say to yourself, let's build one out from reflection and choice. But this time, it's not only a Nigerian thing. Bring your other African brothers and sisters who are going through the same thing. Bring your African-American brothers and sisters who are going through the same thing in their own way. 
bring your Caribbean brothers and sisters because now what you're saying is the internet now allows you to bring everybody. The space has now shrunk or is shrinking. And if you can aggregate that that's leverage at scale, you can potentially build something that's better than the status quo because you're relying on your ability to attract some of the most talented people that cut across sectors within this network. And that, that's the idea here. Okay. So let's look at um, something about... I'll, I'll come back to um, some what the analogy is on the foundation. But um, let's look at the identity of these people. So you mentioned Nigerians or Africans, um, Black Americans, Caribbeans. Mm -hmm. So um, what does an Afropolitan look like? Mm -hmm. if, if I use that word, mm -hmm. what does a person look like? Is he Black? Mm -hmm. Is he European? Mm -hmm. Is he... Like, does he have to be maybe a certain a, mm -hmm. a certain skin color or something like that? Yeah, so the person who wrote, uh, how this idea got inspired for us was the Balaji Srinivasan. He's the former city of Coinbase, right? Mm -hmm. So he wrote this article called How to Start a New Country. And I read this article last April um, 2021. And in the article, as he's laying out, okay, what is the nation, uh, network state? What would it look like? There was a quote in there that said, because the brand new is unthinkable, we fight over the old, right? I remember reading that quote and I'm like, damn, right? Like, okay, me, I'm maybe sometimes based in the US, I see black and white fights, right? Or when I go to another country, is Muslim Christian. When I go to another country, is maybe gay or straight. When I go to Nigeria or come to Africa, it's tribalism. There's always stuff we're all fighting about. And it's always like, most educated people now, these fights don't really have any basis anymore. There's no difference between you're a Christian and a Muslim in, in almost any type of thing apart from which God they choose to worship, right? But both of them have the same hopes, fears, dreams. They, they all want lights. They all want education. They all want to have joy. They all want to sleep peacefully in their homes. So we share the same things. So for us, it was, you're an Afropolitan when you subscribe to the Afropolitan values, right? And because what we're iterating on and what our quote is basically saying is because the brand new is unthinkable, we fight over the old. Part of the old that we fight over is identity when it comes to race, when it comes to religion, when it comes to sex. We don't want to have those fights. We want to build for the future. Now, after we have lights, after we have good roads, after we have abundance in our homes where you can sleep and you can eat jello and you don't have to jump and your friends are leaving and you don't know where you see your family, some people have not seen their family for 10 years. After you have conquered all that, if you don't want to argue about who's a Mayu fan, who's a Chelsea fan, who's a Muslim, who's a Christian, feel free. Because you see, for us, we have let scarcity kill us for so long that because of that scarcity, we fight over the old. But people who are moving abundance, people in Switzerland are not having this issue. I'm not saying that they don't have issues, but you know what I'm saying? It's like, if me and you were citizens of Switzerland right now, and I came on your podcast and I said, bro, I want to start a new country. You look at me like, why? What's wrong with this one? But us, as we're proposing this idea, you know, all of us know, everybody in the streets of Africa knows what's wrong with their countries, right? And, it, and it's, it's epidemic. It's acute. It's leading us to literally change up our dreams, change up our friendships, change up our families. And for us, it's like, enough is enough, right? Yes, let us be pushing the bit I'll be on this side, but also let us be sustainable and say, let's hedge our bets. In case this one no work, we are still pushing on this side regardless. And that, that really is the proposal here. All right. So I have um, a question around leadership, but let's look at, um, let's look at what qualities mm -hmm. the founding members or founding should members have. should have. Mm -hmm. what, what do you expect a yeah. metropolitan yeah. founding member to have? Yeah, so obviously integrity is one, right? Another one is aud audacity. Like you have to be audacious because we need to dream just as big and have bigger ambition, right? Bigger dreams. Fostering excellence, right? Like you have to maintain a certain standard. Like for so long, mediocrity has like choked our necks in across Africa, right? I would say fostering community, right? It should be to the level where you know when an American citizen goes missing anywhere, you, you should have that same thing as an airport. And wherever you go, like you say, you're not you're treated with respect, you're treated with dignity, and you also there's also a little fear in not wanting to mess with you because they know that you have all the people around you who who will come after you or, or come to protect you if anyone messes with you. Those same levels of things because you see, for so long, as a Nigerian, you know, I was like, I don't know what it is to have a government, a government that works. Like, I'm a government unto myself. When something happens, I've never thought, I'll give you an example the whole Russia Ukraine crisis, right? Competent governments, before the war started, governments could come in and say, hey, 
Yeah, American citizen. Oh yeah, we have playing for you. Be there so and so, make it come out. German citizen, we have playing for you. Be there so and so, make it come. Out. Chinese citizen, be. We saw what happened with all the African students and black students, right? And so for me, it's like the Nigerian embassy. I've never, you call them in terms of peace, then they pick up. It's not in terms of war that they will pick up. So for us, it's how do you change that perspective where you actually enjoy the benefits of being a citizen, right? And I think for us, these are the sort of values that those foundational members will help us articulate and then help us actually project to the world after we have aligned. You know what I mean? And I think that's that's part of the foundational blocks you have to build before you then welcome in everyone else so that people know that as they're coming into your house, people are actually taking the time to lay the foundation and any questions or frequently asked questions that people might have, it gets answered accordingly. Okay. Mm-hmm. So moving on to the question of leadership, um, th- that's very crucial for any nation. Mm-hmm. And how, what does that look like or what would that look like yeah. for Afropolitan? What, how would you go about choosing leaders? Mm-hmm. How would you go about, mm-hmm. I don't know whether the idea, mm-hmm. the underlying political idea is going to be democracy mm-hmm. or something. So what is your, because you need a political ideology at some point. So what's the political ideology are, yeah. um, like? So I think what, we, what, what the way that we're um, approaching this is the tech that's available today allows us to um, innovate on even governance, right? So one of the ways we want to innovate on governance is something called a DAO. Right, so it's a decentralized autonomous organization, and I'll explain. Remember when John answers when he would ask us who are the leaders, who are the leaders, and we would say we are all leaders. Sure, you get it's that same type of mindset, but this time you're using blockchain to verify it, and I'll explain what I mean. So, with the blockchain or with even a DAO, right, you're able to form sub DAOs, right? So, you can say, or in, in democracy, they say subcommittees, right? So, you can say a subcommittee that is working on maybe investments, a subcommittee that's working on maybe roles or subcommittee that's working on this, and you're fetching for the best leaders to lead it. And But the difference now is when it comes time for voting proposals, it's on chain. Everybody can see. It's very transparent, right? When it comes time to maybe the treasury for the DAO, it's on chain. It's on the treasury. You should be able to see it's like a coin market cap or a stock market cap, like this is how much you have in the country. Or Then when it comes time to dispersing, it's going to public ledgers, public blockchain addresses that you can see. This is how much I was allocated for roads. The person that is doing it or the contractor that wins it shows proof of work. So you get so before they will, before it gets fully dispersed, right? You can say maybe okay, we'll start off by twenty five percent deposits. Show the work. The next twenty five percent goes. Do you know what I'm saying? You use the tech to to make people be more accountable and then the transparency to make people show. I'll give the examples right there. Let me you know what to say. Answers. Feminist, co- feminist coalition. Every time, maybe every week, you'll be publishing this is how much we've raised, this is how much we've spent, this is what I went to, right? Now they were doing that manually, but you, maybe nobody might be able to verify in the back end. What we're now saying is that should be on chain, where this is how much has come in, this is how much is going. Anyone, any citizen that has time that wants to go and see it, let them go and see it, and then the proof of work also is there. Right now, in traditional countries like Nigeria, for example, we know contracts are given, but work never gets done. And then somebody got another contract for it. And work never gets done. And so where's the accountability, right? I mean, what are the consequences for failure too? So I think for us, that's the innovation that we're looking to use. That's why we say it's a Web3 product as well, because it allows you to use the principles of blockchain and Web3 to actually execute towards governance. And I think that that's the way we, we look at it. Okay. Mm-hmm. So um, technology could be perfect, mm-hmm. even if it isn't. Um, but humans are flawed. Yeah, definitely. So how do you... How do you solve for humans? Mm-hmm. Because mm-hmm. you can use Web3 to make all mm-hmm. these decisions. Mm-hmm. But there's always a human factor mm-hmm. there. So how, how are you going to solve mm-hmm. for the problem of humans? Yeah. yeah. So I think what you can then do is like you compare it to existing states that are working. What, is, what are they doing right that's working for them? And what are, they, what are we doing wrong here? So what, what do we have? So take for Dubai, for example, right? It's not really the word democracy, right? But they have leaders who are visionaries, right? People who want best for their people. Take Singapore, democracy, right? They have leaders, again, who, some of the smartest, some of the most talented, some of the most gifted, but they clearly want the best for their people, right? When you look at Nigeria, right, <laughs> it's not the best of our best in any capacity. Unless best criminals, you know, it's <laughs> the best award for that. That's what, that's what they are, right? But there's no, like... You cannot look. Uh, you cannot look at Tinubu and look at Peter Obi. There's no, there's no galaxy in which they're in the same room. You should get. But because our foundation was weak, these are the choices that we we now have. So what we're saying is, 
when we're choosing for these foundational citizens, what we're optimizing for is not just by status or wealth or where you go to school for, it's what has been your track record up until this point, right? Show working, but you're optimizing for maybe people like Peter Obis, maybe Peter like Ngozi Arela, maybe people like even Mother Teresa types, people who have done the work that don't need the spotlight, they've just done the work. Right, and then you optimize for those sort of people to be in the foundation of citizens, and because they're the ones who are going to traditionally start off the voting, people like that more than likely will not make dumb voting choices, right? And so, if you can leverage that and then intentionally build okay, 1,000 now, 2,000 now, 3,000 now, but that as more people are coming in, even if people not everybody wants to vote, to be honest, right? But then they can say, okay, this is my delegates, right? My delegates is maybe someone like a Peter Obi within here. I trust Peter Obi's judgment. He's going to represent my choices in here. So humans are flawed. It's true. But there are also countries in the world that work. We're not asking. What are we asking for here? We're not asking for too much. Nigerians never ask for too much. Africans never ask for too much. We don't. We don't even get much to begin with. So we never ask for too much. What are we asking for here? Bro, build road. Road has been solved in the world. Just build the road. Okay, bro, we want constant light. Light has been solved as a problem. Okay, we want good healthcare. Okay, we want. We're not, what are we asking for? What are we really asking for? Are we saying that oh, you know, every day give us one million dollars? No. We're just asking for the same basic amenities that other people in the world, where countries work, enjoy. But for some reason here, it's a luxury. So for me, it's like, it's not a heavy lift mentally. It's just to say the right people are not in the right positions. And I think this idea sparked for me when during NSAS, right, we were at the, we were at the gates, people at the gates protesting. And on Twitter, I'll see, I'll see somebody say, hey guys, please, oh, we need an ambulance. Ambulance will show up. I'm like, bro, I didn't know we had ambulances in Lagos. I'm just being honest with you because I've never seen one before. So I'm like, somebody will then say some, tweet something again. Hey, guys, we need help for that. Show up. And I'm like, wait, so we do have competent people in this country, like people who sabi. Because, you know, sometimes you think, like, maybe you're the only same person or maybe the same people in Lagos are not up to five. But I'm like, there are people who can run this country, but for some reason, they're not the ones in positions of power and executing. So what happened where, as a country, and across African countries, we are governed by the worst of our worst. Well, at what point did we get there? Like, what happened, right? And so, for us now, it's saying, how do we optimize and say the, some of the best minor people or the talented people or the people who want best for themselves and for their community are the ones who are empowered to lead it? And I, and I think for us is why we're starting off with the network first of people who are builders or operators, creatives, thinkers, writers, people who've always wanted to do their best work. And then you know that when you come in here, you have a network of people who can keep you inspired, are waiting for you, and they're highly aligned. And that's, that's the thought process here. Okay. So we're going to go for uh, just take a brief ad break, and then when we get back, we're going okay. to be looking at possibly the business model of okay. Afropolitan. So um, I hope you've been having a very interesting conversation up to this point. I hope you've been enjoying it. And this is the point where I tell you about the Tech Point Africa FinTech Summit. And it's coming up on November 26th. It's a Saturday, so you really have no excuse not to be there. And the FinTech Summit is a gathering of Africa's or Nigeria's best FinTech minds. They're going to be sharing ideas and their thoughts on how the industry should get to the next level, what's currently happening, and how you can plug into it. So if you want to be the next pay stack, if you want to be the next flutter wave, or if you just want to be um, the next Ted or Ladele that stays at the place for five years but is richer than those who have been junketing, <laughs> yeah, this is the event for you. So head over to fintech.tech.africa. Don't like, don't pause the video. You keep on watching. Do this after fintech.tech.africa. Register for now. You could get the um, general ticket for four thousand naira. Well, if you want to have exclusive access to some of the brightest minds in fintech, then you probably want the VIP ticket. You get free lunch, by the way. Mm. So think about that and get the um, tickets today. So, yeah, I'll see you there. And if you are there, you can say hi or not. So, yeah, let's continue here. Love it. So, you you raised money last year? This year. Okay, this year. Yeah. And... Um, that was, I think that was the first time I heard mm -hmm. about Afropolitan, uh, which is funny because mm -hmm. I had been following Chica before then. Mm -hmm. But um, I think that was the first time I heard mm -hmm. about Afropolitan. And, of course, you raise money from, from VCs, yeah. that goes without saying. Yeah. And you're building a network state mm -hmm. that has, um, there's politics involved. Mm -hmm. And VCs, mm -hmm. they optimize for returns. Of course. They, 
they need to put their money and see mm-hmm. that money um, bring returns. Mm-hmm. So I assume that there's a business model of course around Afropolitan. Mm-hmm. You, you touched on it, providing mm-hmm. services and mm-hmm. then having people um, mm-hmm. pay for those services. Mm-hmm. Um, I think a couple of months ago, um, Jack Dorsey. Jack Dorsey went on this rant about um, VCs, VCs mm-hmm. and Web3 and mm-hmm. basically saying that they were investing in something that they were going to control. Mm-hmm. Now, how do you ensure that a noble dream like this mm-hmm. doesn't get hijacked yeah. by a few VCs? Because yeah. So I think, let me explain the business model for it, right? And I'll give you precedence. And I know some people on Twitter this week are like, they don't like when I use this example, but it's a real example, like, Israel, for example, if you go back to how it started, it was actually similar to what we're doing. Manifesto, yeah. company that collected investments and a foundation, right? That f- investment arm that funded Israel or the Jewish states owns 13% of Israel today. So you can imagine the returns that they have had <laughs> in the existence of it, right? What, what The reason I bring that up is the way to think about this is instead of, you know, instead of funding a company, you're funding a country, how does a country make profits when you're talking about taxes or you're talking about P2P partnerships or private public, right? You're talking about um, transaction fees, right? Mm -hmm. Or even people buying their passport. There are many revenue generating mechanisms that a country can unlock, right? But the first thing, before you get to a country, you actually have to show they're able to bring people together, right? So that's where our experience comes in because we've been doing that for the last 10 plus years, right? So now the question is, what comes first, the nation or the state, right? Is the nation, because the nation is the community first that has shared ideals, shared consciousness, or shared even DNA, right? Is the community first, the state comes after. So what we're saying is, when we've built the community, right, and you layer on the state aspects, right, you can now start generating revenues on some of these touch points. So the first touch point is maybe passports. So NFTs, you're going to sell some of them, you generate revenue through that. That's just one item. The other one is your tech stack, right? If you're providing services for people, they're joining your app, they're making purchases, you charge a transaction fee, that's one revenue right there. But even the land parts, right? Okay, people want to buy homes, right? Okay, are you the one providing them loans for those homes, mortgages for those homes? Are you the one providing them, um, um, and then they're paying interest on that to you as the country, right? So there's so many ways where you can stack up your value-added services where you're going, you're going through, you're not just like, like I used to say, like with our party, because we set up as a party events company, we don't just party with people, we go through life with them. Sure you get. So you see now, like, from from the different ways in which we plan on generating revenue, but the first thing we have to be able to do is actually have that community. Because it's not about a, and this is the conversation people are having, it's a network state isn't technology first and community second. It's community first, then technology second, because the technology enables the community. Technology is not the product. You know what I'm saying? So the community itself is the first thing that you're focusing on and optimizing for. So that, that's the phase one that we're in right now. Right. So what happens when a VC probably wants to exit? That's usually how mm-hmm. they do that. Mm-hmm. Um, in your case? So the eventually, have a bottom, we have tokens, right? So you have currency. So similar to the way to imagine this is imagine you are a VC who funded Bitcoin when it first started or a VC, which really happened with Ethereum, funded Ethereum, right? When Ethereum then joined then cashes are maybe the VC owns maybe 3% of Ethereum tokens. They then liquidate that way. Or they can liquidate through equity, which is where the transaction fees go as the value of that goes. If whatever percentage that they own, they take it from there. But no VC actually owns the majority of the country, right? It's just saying that your returns are capped at maybe the same type of 13% that Israel had or at 10% of the token, overall tokens in supply. So it's never going to be a thing where a VC is like, oh, I own the country. Oh, yeah, sorry now. Let me, it, it doesn't, it should never, it doesn't even get to that level in the first place. Your, your returns are capped at a certain percentage. Mm. Okay. Yeah. So um, you will need acceptance from other countries around of course, existing countries. Allies, yeah. yeah, and that's that's going to be a a huge mm-hmm. step. Mm-hmm. So how what what are your plans mm-hmm. for getting to that point? And I sitting here I just think that would be very, very difficult mm-hmm. because um, even in Africa, mm-hmm. I can't remember the state that has been trying I, I think there was a time when we have facilitated between fifty three 54 countries, mm-hmm. 53 so states, wake up, yeah. Out down, yeah. and it was always a problem to mm-hmm. recognize them. Mm-hmm. So how do you go about ensuring that um, that becomes a thing? So I think um, a lot of these things are 
networking relationships, allies, literally consistently pitching your idea, drawing people in, going into different areas, making your pitch. But there's also about value that you're creating, right? So the thing is, I'm someone who moved to the States when I was 15, right? I, I started college maybe when I was 18. I started doing events that came to the African diaspora when I was 19, right? I'm 32 now, so about maybe 12 years. I've seen how Afrobeats uh, events I was doing since I was 19 to 32 is night and day. So we were the ones who ushered it into the diaspora. We're now the ones who were, saw it grow to where it's at. And since then, it might have started off as a thing that only Nigerians came to. And then eventually went to Kimita, then where other Africans in the diaspora came to. And then eventually became a thing where African Americans then started coming to it. Then the white people, then the Latinos, then the Caribbeans, then everybody. So that now you see, you watch Bernard Boy perform, he's in Finland, there are no other black people around, 70,000 white people. Sure, you get. It's again about leveraging the network that you have, right? Can you have a Bernard Boy within your network who has access to allies who might be willing to? who maybe are fans of his music, so he says, hey, this is a project that we're working on now. Even if it, you can't give us recognition now, can we? Can our people have access where if we come, right, we get to be in this land area that people have, and people are not doing anything with it, and we can buy that land. These are just conversations, right? And these things are possible. To, again, not to belabor the point, when Israel started, it was just diaspora. They didn't have land. So how did they get land in the first place? It was allies. Allies that were in the British government, allies that were in other governments, they're just working and consistently being like, hey, this is what our people need. But, okay, maybe you guys are not ready to accept, to recognize us now. What can you give us? Take this one first. Because at the end of the day, this is a long-term game, right? But what can you give us now that's a tangible value that we can go back to our people with and say, this is what we have for you? And then we keep on, because it never stops. You're never going to stop wanting what it is that you want. But you're going to understand that the journey isn't a sprint. It's a marathon. But you want to keep on building momentum, right? Like, okay, today, guys, before, we, I'll give you another example. So Portugal on October 30th is releasing their technician um, visa where they say if you earn $2,500 a month, you can come and spend a year visa with, with a visa. Okay, what if we now go to um, Portugal and say, hey, we have a person members, maybe average of them they earn between fifty thousand to two hundred thousand dollars a year. They're willing to come to your country for this technician visa. Give us a special Afropolitan type visa where our members now get two years instead of one year. You see what I'm saying? These are conversations that you can actually have with countries that exist today because a lot of countries are looking for revenue. So even if you're not starting off with the Portugal, you can start off with the smaller countries that don't even know where revenue is coming. Maybe because of COVID, they've been they've been um, um, rocked by by the effects or the economic effects of the pandemic, right? These are the sort of conversations that you can have, and because you're dealing with people who have other things that they want, and maybe you have things that 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 what they want, maybe you have it. You now have conversations. So it's not to say that immediately. All 195 countries will recognize you immediately. But it's to say that you start off with the ones that are more likely to work with you and you ladder your way up. It's a ladder. Keep on working up that way. That's okay. So the Israel example is interesting because Israel had like a rocky path to get to where they were. 50 years. Yeah. And they actually started with the diaspora and they needed land. Yeah. So it wasn't they, just... They the bought land. Yeah, it wasn't just a matter of um, we have a shared identity. Of course. It was, it was partially driven or heavily driven by adversity. And they got into a lot of problems. Did we not have adversity. <laughs> yeah, I know, but like, this was, this was like huge. Ah, like yeah. they were literally losing their lives. No, no, no. The Holocaust came after, right? Yeah. So, but before that, they were already always running into issues. The same issues that we're running into. Yeah. Yeah. So... But yeah, the Holocaust obviously was a huge, uh, a huge factor. Yeah. Yeah. But they've had a lot of issues. Yeah. I mean, in the process of getting the land, mm -hmm. a lot of human rights violations had to take place. Yes. And it's always it's always a possibility yeah. in yeah. Um, situations like this because you're getting land from mm -hmm. a certain group of people. It's not like the land is just there for your taking. Of course. So of course. That's a problem one. Mm -hmm. And there's 
there's also the fact that we have a few charter cities around the world. Okay, yeah. 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 So first, how is a nation, a network digital state. nation or network state different from mm-hmm. a charter city? Yeah. So there's a possibility in which network states can p- partner with charter cities. So for example, a person could partner with a tiny city, right? Mm-hmm. But you can see that without the network states, the charter cities were already able to buy land. Nobody's protesting the science city land that I know of, right? So there's always land available to buy, just where you're, where you're willing to go build, right? Mm-hmm. Obviously, you might not want to come and build in, in the middle of VI because VI is already packed, but you find land and then your committee members can move there. The difference between network states and other cities is a network state optimizes for that highly aligned community. A other city optimizes for the land. I don't know if you see what I'm saying. So charity city is land first, pe- people second. Network state is people first, land second. So that's the difference. That's the the difference in mindset because when you optimize for the community first, you're focusing on other things longer term before you get to the land. When you optimize for the charter city first, you're saying I need the land first, and then I might go and market for the people. But you don't care whether the people are have like minded values. You're just like I'm not selling land here, and people should move. So I'm saying it's a different, it's a different sort of um, mindset to those projects. Okay. Yeah. Well, so even in that case, um, I think. There's Prospera in Honduras, yes. and it's, it's the, one of our partners to you. Okay, and yeah. it's currently having like it, well, let's say a hard time mm-hmm. um, because the Honduras government was backing um was um yeah no go on so. yeah so they have issues mm-hmm. especially from the people who were in those um mm-hmm. in those areas before so mm-hmm. that's an that's like I don't know an example yeah that's an example of um, something that could go wrong mm-hmm. but. Um, well, I guess you have it covered. But well, let's move on. No, to no, no. Let, let, me, let me be clear. This okay. thing we are doing is not an easy thing to do. Yeah. Let's, let's not confuse anybody. The reason we have to do it, though, is because we have to do it. <laughs> do you understand what I'm saying? It's like, if we did not have to do it, we would not be doing it. Check it. Out. If we were, again, like I said, if we were citizens of Switzerland, and I came to you and I said, bro, make me start a new country, you would literally look at me like, why? What is wrong with this one? And any complaints I made would, would pale in comparison to what we're paying. Look at American founding fathers, right? Why did they start a new country? Because they told them to pay for tea, more for tea. They didn't say, maybe you should start drinking coffee. Or maybe you should just start drinking orange juice. They said, no, we're going to start a new country. See the mindset. This is the difference in mindset. Us, tea is not our problem. Our problems, if I start to name them, we won't finish this podcast. What we're now saying is, enough is enough, Right? If the solution to this was through elections, it would have worked already. Mm-hmm. If it was through war, it would have worked already. If it was through revolution, it would have worked already. If it was through protests, it would have worked already. We have tried a bunch of solutions. Now what we're saying is this is now one more solution to try. And that if it works, we're still in the status quo. But if it, no, if it doesn't work, status quo is over. And, but if it works, we're out of the status quo. So to us, it's like, it's, it's either do or die. And we'd rather do and die so that's just the mindset here so it's not an easy thing to do at all like i'm, I'm not confused about it but to me it's existential for us uh, as africans worldwide you know so okay so yeah. final question would be um what are some of the challenges that you envisage mm-hmm. as you go on this journey i think um i was thinking about this i was talking to some of my f- family friends last night that everything else that we talk about whether it's, you're talking about land right real estate solved for you've seen people build things from ground up so land, that those are challenges, but those are things that have been solved for. So either we build it ourselves or we partner with people who savvy build them and build it. Okay, tech or products, things that have been solved for. The main challenge that we have to face is a mindset one, right? A mindset that has always told us we can't do enough or we can't build or we can't innovate, right? Or we have to wait for white people to do it before we do it, which is, oh, people keep on asking me, has this been done anywhere in the world before? I'm like, no. This is the first, this is innovative. This is literally the first thing we're, we're working on. There's no other place you can point to as an example of this being done. So then you're like, okay, cool. So why are you doing it? Because you see, we're used to saying when we build in Africa, a white person has done it before, so we're going to come and replicate it. And I'll give you an example. Oh, yeah, we're going to do um, Uber for Africa or food delivery stuff. You know, Uber eats. We have seen it. Okay, cool. Okay, we want to build a fintech company. Okay, we have seen Stripe. We can do it. Oh, we want to do a hotel. We have seen Airbnb. We can do it. Not to say that there's anything wrong to building those. Those are services that are needed. But we don't always have to look here to draw inspiration. From here, this continent, you can innovate and show the world a different way 
of looking at things, of being, of moving, you know, because to us, we're the ultimate outsiders, whether it's Africans or just Nigerians specifically, but the only ones that have to navigate use VPN to access all these type of things. If it's, we're always just moving from an outsider perspective because they're always locking us out. Think about it. Every other day you wake up, they have banned Nigerians from here or they're tired of Nigerians being here. Or they're tired of, it's like, bro, at what, at what point can we truly be free? And it's the internet that allows us to express that freedom because on the internet, you see how we thrive. Our music is traveling. Our movies are traveling. Our food is traveling. Our fashion is traveling. Okay, then it's like, how do we double down on this internet? Because it's like, this is the only lane that the, that the road is free. Every other lane, they block us. Tell us like, nah. Well, on the internet, you see us thrive. And I think it's us now saying, let us double down on this internet that, that we have and really push our leverage on it. So, yeah. Okay, interesting. So, okay. this has been a very interesting conversation. Mm-hmm. And um, I hope we can have... A further conversation What's probably in maybe a year when you <laughs> give you status updates, yeah, to get status updates. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, thank you so much for thank your time. Thank you for having me. Thank you for having me. All okay, right, so on. you ask that brings us to the end of this not public service announcement, but yeah, <laughs> it brings us to the end of this podcast. I hope thank you. this was insightful, entertaining, informative. And um, if you have questions, please drop them in the comment section, yes, and um, we would. If I can't do it, I would take it to HA and Please do. back to you. Please so do. Thanks so much for... You want to no, yeah, I was going to say, if you'd like to be one of our first foundational citizens, please visit afroporting.io. Yeah. Right? There's an application process. The reason, again, that we're using the application process is to help us honestly filter for the sort of people that we want to be part of this foundational citizens because it's important that the foundational citizens have high alignments right and they're the sort of people that you would want anyone would want to see leading this sort of movement so please visit afroporting.io and feel free to connect with the team and connect with me if you want to all right so you heard the man afropolitan.io visit it be a part of this and um, yeah i was saying drop your comments um drop your questions and if I can answer them, like I said, I'll pass them on to him. So thank you for staying with us to this point and I'll see you in the next video. No, no, in the next video actually. I'll see you sometime. <laughs> yeah, get the point. So thank, thank you so much. Yeah. Bye. All right. Bye.